Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi. Yeah, we can. Well, you guys know Eggy yeah. and Hi. Hi. Net, Hi. Natalia. Hi. And uh, here we are at this casual conversation that we're calling a craft center practice. Okay, so Thank you for coming. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> okay, so um, we are really just going to be quite casual in this mm. conversation, right? And for questions, leave it at the end. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Okay, if you have any burning questions at the moment, do you want them to like ask at the point? Or shall we shall we leave everything yeah, at the end? Me too. Okay, yeah. so we'll leave all the questions to the end. Just try to like hold on to your questions. Yeah. So in today's casual conversation with Eggy, we will be discussing her craft and textile art in the context of Singapore. We'll also be talking about the process of setting up this exhibition from conceptualization all the way to the launch. I uh, was I not here yesterday? Lisa Johnson. Yeah. Okay, a couple of people. All right. So that's when Aggie had the talk with. What is his name? Uh, Sam. Sam. Oh, yeah. Right. Our Singaporeans. Our Singaporeans. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So without further ado, I think we'll begin. Yeah. So I feel like most of you here know Aggie. Is anyone here um, seeing Aggie for the first time? Ah, a couple of people. All right. So just a quick introduction, Aggie is a textile artist based in Singapore. She is most known for her free motion embroidery and uh, her works um, largely cover natural elements. And what I love about her works personally, I've known her for a few years now, is that she takes things that people often do not see, like for instance cracks and discolorations in the concrete in the void decks, for instance the roadside weeds all around us that people you know, would step on without a second thought. She takes those small little things and she elevates them into works of art. You know, she tells us to pay attention to all the small little things around and within ourselves as well. So that's what I love about her work. Um, so Aggie, perhaps, you know, could you tell us more about how you approach your practice? Hmm, how I approach it? Well, actually, um, my practice involves a lot of slowing down, um, and I only dis- I didn't- uh, well, I didn't- I would say, like, I discovered, like, the whole idea of slowing down, um, when I was feeling a bit burnt out. Um, so previously, I was working in corporate sector, um, in NEA, and then uh, after that, I went into uh, promoting fast fashion. Uh, not fast fashion. Promoting a, a sustainable fashion in in Singapore. And then at that time, um, I I found that I wasn't taking care of myself, and I realized that if I'm not taking care of myself, how can I take care of others? And so that's when I started to slow down. And when I started slowing down, I noticed all these different things in nature and I discovered the lines, the colors, the different textures um, of the trees, you know, of the ground and at that point I, I you know, started um, sketching in my, in my journal, you know, all these different textures and I realized, oh, can I actually bring this uh, forward into my artwork uh, and show people how to also slow down and take notice of things. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So for you, it started with noticing, noticing. your own emotions mm. and also with starting to note down your observations through sketches. Yes. Okay. So I mean, if uh, if you talk to my family, they would be running on the on in the park, and I would be the one like behind, like just like crawl, you know, not not crawling, but like slowly just walking around, squatting and suddenly taking a photo or just like being the weird one and just like, you know, doing little sketches or taking leaves and all those little things that you don't really see, like people are usually um, blind to or have no notice of. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah, so it almost feels like you're a scientist, you're like capturing the semi-invisible things that are in plain sight, we just don't pay attention to them. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because actually my tr background training is in science, so I do feel like this the whole uh, process of being a scientist actually uh, is part of my practice as well because there's a lot of documentation, uh, like all the um, experiments that I do with my textiles, I actually document them down 
Um, yeah, so in, in a way that's like a scientific experiment as well. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so that really goes into yeah. the creative research and you can mm. see exactly how the idea developed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And if there are things that I feel that are useful or I can use in the, in the artwork, then I'll take that forward as, you know, as the uh, practice first. Mm, okay, well, thanks for sharing about that. So I'm curious to hear more about, you know, the artwork conceptualization process. So if there's that research and development aspect, then how do you progress it onwards to um, making creative decisions around the work? And, you know, I'm also curious about why textile art? Oh, let's answer the why textile art. Um, I... I like it because it's a very tactile, um, uh, tactile experience. Uh, when you work with something with your hands, it's for me. It's very immersive and it's a very intimate experience. And I found that when I work on something, everything just—it feels like everything around me just melts away. So there's this psychologist. Um, I'm gonna talk torture his name, it's uh, Mihai Chicks something. <laughs> yeah, okay. Very long yes, surname. Yes, very long surname. So he, he said that um, when you work with something that's repetitive, there's this creative flow or this um, zone that you go into. So I experienced that. And um, if you talk to my husband, there was one time that I was actually so in the zone. I had my earphones on, headphones on, and I was so in the zone that I, I couldn't hear what he was saying to me. I was just so focused. And I find, I find that with uh, when you're doing something like textile art, that it, I create my own safe space. Yeah. So that, that's, that's how I feel about uh, textile art. And thirdly, it's, there are so many opportunities with textile art. Um, there's like, I mean, I'm just probably touching the, the surface of it, like with uh, free motion embroidery and hand stitching. There's like weaving, which is what you do, there's crochet, felting. So there's a whole wide range of um, yeah, things that you can explore and there's so much potential behind it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was a response to the question as well, which was the process. Was that right? Yeah. Yeah. So how do I start? Um, I I basically choose uh, subjects which I find um, that I'm very curious about. So, with the corals, it was some a sub topic that's uh, very close to my heart because it's uh, I'm an environmental advocate also. But um, they they have a, such a fragile and delicate beauty to them. So I was very interested in the lines, the colors, and the shapes. And um, initially, I was taking photos, and then I had a trip to this island called. Um, which is between uh, Malaysia and Singapore um, and I saw a lot of corals there and I did a walk at uh, Kepo which is the south of Singapore so I was gathering all this information um, and then I did research in the library as well I was looking for specific corals that were uh, that uh, were native to Singapore as well so I found inspiration from like uh, the mushroom corals uh, bubble corals and the tubular corals, which you, you'll be able to see in my works here. Um, so the initial step has always been like doing the sketches and then trying to replicate uh, those, um, those forms in stitch. So that was the most difficult part for me. Uh, it, the experimentation, especially for this particular exhibition, started in January last year. Yeah, um, it was a long process just to try and find out what particular stitches worked, uh, the type of threads that I could use. So I was very fortunate I had Madeira sponsor the threads, um, but obviously I had to choose them first. Also the type of fabric, um, because I wanted to um, be able to mold the fabric in such a way, but at least it would stay in the right in the right shape that I wanted. Um, and so that process, uh, yeah, that took a long time. Uh, and so the uh, 
once I got that, so actually I have like samples here. So my first set of, yeah, really ugly as you can see here. Yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was trying to get, um, use colors that would uh, emulate the, the corals. So um, actually when you walked into the uh, gallery, you saw like two, two canvases on the right as you go in. So those were my first um, uh, pieces after I figured out the experimentation. Uh, and then when I went on to this, um, yeah, I wanted to make it more diverse. I just didn't want to just focus on the mushroom coral. So I was trying, yeah, experimenting, trying to figure out like um, how, how could I do this? Uh, so the initial sample, it looks nice, but then when I try to expand it, um, yeah, that's when the, the hard work got in. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, uh, so I, I settled on using organza. I needed a lot of organza. And thankfully, my friend Adele from Mutawa, she, yeah, she sponsored the, the uh, organza remnants. So they were from yeah, it's, uh, it's wedding from gowns from Angel, yeah. Angel Hearts. Yeah, so they had a lot of um, organza fabric. So I used, used that. And I used the uh, shibori method. So shibori. Uh, people use your, usually associate it with uh, dyeing. Uh, so it's when you wrap something with a fabric and you tie it and you dip it into dye. But with organza, because it's made of uh, a plastic, well, it's like a polyester, so you can mold it with heat. Uh, and so you, use, you can use the shibori method there. And with the stitches, um, did a lot of experimentation. So initially, I was gonna go for this type of stitch, and then I realized this does not look right. Um, and I eventually uh, ended up using um, uh, broderie anglaise. So broderie anglaise is like a very traditional embroidery technique, it's where you cut out the fabric and you uh, use embroidery to. Um, clean it up basically. This is why you see the holes and that gave the, the coral structures a more uh, fragile and delicate feel to it. Yeah, so that, that was my, I guess that was like my entire process, but there was a lot of pain to it because um, even though I knew that I was doing the exhibition in June, um, I had to be really disciplined. Like uh, every day I would make um, and if there were mistakes, I would learn from that and then try to learn from it and continue to make, keep going, keep going at it. it and uh, I had a really uh, good support system, like I had Alin and um, Melanie at the back there. So they, yeah, they, they got me through that, that whole process. So that was good, yeah. And my husband as well. <laughs> <laughs> my family, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, so yeah, that was uh, yeah, a long journey. And I have to add that um, because I wanted to make it interactive, I wanted that um, uh, interactivity with the audience. So we, I incorporated Ardu Arduino into it. So it's an open source uh, uh, electronic system. And uh, I couldn't do that because I wanted to focus on the on the sewing, so uh, my yeah, my partner helped me. <laughs> my husband helped me with that, so he's at the back. So he, if you want to know more about it, you can approach him to get mm -hmm. some explanation <laughs> to it. Yeah. So yeah, that that was um, it's yeah, it's quite a journey. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so this like last long. one and a half years. Yes. Yeah. Really but the actual the uh, once I got mm -hmm. the whole technique um, on par. Uh, I started the actual making in about March, March, April. Yeah. Mm, I see. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so art, yeah, textile art or any art actually takes time. Mm. Yeah, it's not like how you see on social media, like the 15 second reels, like da da. <laughs> yeah, it's not like that. Five minute crafts. <laughs> yes, five minute crafts. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, yeah, please okay. come. Yeah. Well, I'll see you. April, May last year or this year? Uh, started the actual making uh, would be this year. You're very fast. Yes. Uh, Just two months. Yeah. Oh, no, no, this is March, March. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, because, okay, so initially when I started making, 
it would be like just one one bubble a day. And then uh, I remember my husband saying, "Are you sure this is going to work? You're only making one a day. Don't you do you need to find a more efficient <laughs> method of making this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I I think I did because there are about." 200 of oh. these pieces on that, yeah. So I managed to find like once you get going, you you manage to find a a way of doing it uh, quicker. I would say, yeah. Mm. Yeah. 200 bubbles, and you only had three months to do this. Yeah. Wow. So I so I progressed uh, in such a way that I was making like six or ten in one go. Mm. Yeah, so it became like a batch. I, I hate to say this. <laughs> like it's, it's not like manufacturing, but it, it became, it, it felt like that at some point. Right. Yeah. And then in between I was making the, the hoops for Fragile Beauty at the back and then the pieces for Relics over there. Wow. Um, so one woman production house basically. Uh, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I mean, it definitely helps to have all that material research mm -hmm. so that while you're in the middle of the process, you don't realize, oh, oh this is not going to yes. work with everything. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, experimentation and research is very important, mm -hmm. I realize, because yeah. yeah, if you're halfway and you realize, oh, this is not going to work, then it's difficult to backtrack. Yeah. yeah, and you know your material so well that you can even extend the possibilities, you know, like for what you did with the Broadway on Glaze. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, what we gathered from what you said just now was there are a lot of techniques that you chose to use in one piece alone. So how did your educational process of learning those techniques begin? Um, it was more of a discovery um, for this one. Um, like I knew I wanted to use free motion embroidery, but it was a matter of choosing and experimenting. Uh, what technique to use and I discovered the broderie anglaise uh, beginning of last year and I think that was when broderie anglaise in clothing oh which is what Lisa <laughs> is wearing sorry to put the spotlight on you <laughs> yeah so I, I saw it in clothing and I was thinking hey this looks like something similar to like what's on corals because it's like yeah the, the structure and everything yeah, so I actually took an online course for the embroidery and glaze, and I'm like, okay, I can do this. And uh, but the lady she was teaching it uh, using hand, um, and then I thought, okay, I can use this on the sewing machine and sort of speed things up a bit. Yeah. Oh, that's so, innovation. Yeah, yes. innovation happens. Yeah, everywhere. <laughs> You were talking yeah. about making one bubble a day and then realizing you needed to make more. more. And yeah. So I'm curious about you know how you discovered ways to um, make the uh, make the production a little bit you know heavier each day. How did I discover ways? Um, I think it was just a sheer matter of sheer will, <laughs> just like stress, <laughs> stress and stress as well. <laughs> the best. Yeah, and realizing that the t uh, deadline is like coming up pretty mm. soon. And, and also, um, I think when you are, I wouldn't say desperate, but you know you have to work towards it and you have a vision, you just um, experiment all the time. So once I knew that um, you could use embroidery on glaze with hand, I thought, okay, this could be possible with a sewing machine. Yeah, and so I started experimenting there and then um, I had, um, so initially I only had one hoop, and with one hoop you can only make so many. So then I decided, okay, I'm going to buy a lot of hoops, hoop them all up, draw out, and then start stitching in one go, and then focusing on the shibori, and then, um, yeah, on the rotary and glaze. So it's like a step-by-step -step process. Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you can imagine your room is just full of hoops one day and then the next week it's full of yeah, other things. Yeah, so um, my family has been very forgiving because like literally the work was spread out. Um, dining area, then my son's room, and then <laughs> the bedroom. <laughs> Yeah, so yes. Mm. <laughs> so we're very forgiving. <laughs> a really immersive art, you yes, were immersive, yes. Mm. And I uh, also for this piece, um, I actually um, did the sampling on our living room wall as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I actually set it up. So uh, the, the first version was on the wall, then we tested it out, 
and then there was the second version, yeah, and then the electronics had to, because I was working with uh, the electronics as well, so I had to have the, at least the first version up before the electronics could come in, so we could see the effects as well, mm. yeah, so, yeah, there's, I find that when you're working uh, for, you're doing a solo, there's also the project management part that comes in, so you're not just the artist, you're the project manager, and you have to have all those timelines set in place so that you keep yourself in on track. Mm -hmm. Exactly. There's yeah, many, many moving many, parts. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I'm sure you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When it comes to setting up an exhibition like this, like even producing the work is like one big endeavor already. Yet having yeah. to organize and collaborate with different people at each stage of the project. So for this one, you had a collaboration with the NAC. Yes. Yes, and also with our Singapore awesome Reefs. Reefs. Yeah. yeah. Can you share a little bit more about each stage of those? Yeah. So with NEC, oh, that's where I got the grant. So I'm really thankful for them. <laughs> so I have to mention them. Uh, so that process, uh, I put in the submission for the grant in I think it was November. Yeah. So that was really early on. So I had to have the whole concept and yeah, the proposal ready by then. Our Singapore Reefs, I actually approached them uh, also in November because I wanted to uh, actually give the viewers some context to what I was doing. And they came in to give a talk yesterday. They gave some scientific background to the corals as well. because I So for relics, I wanted to make dead corals and I had no idea what they looked like. So Sam from our Singapore Reefs, she actually shared some information with me. And she came up with the posters because I wanted um, basically to, as you experience the exhibition, to be able to wrap up and say, oh, what can I do as, a, as an individual in Singapore? So yeah, so they came up with these pictures, which I thought was amazing, and the information. So yeah, um, and yeah, so when you're collaborating with someone um, like Singapore, our uh, Singapore is, uh, I had to be on calls with them. Um, get them in line with my uh, with my uh, project management, um, well, the timeline that I also had. And they're also very busy because actually this week they have the Asia Pacific Reef Conference. So they were preparing for that as well. Um, yeah, so just, it was a bit stressful. <laughs> I'm trying to like get everyone's like timelines in place. Mm, yeah, I see. Mm. Okay, so your own vision and the production, the NEC as a grantor and our Singapore Coral Reefs as a partner in the collaboration in this entire endeavor mm -hmm. for advocacy for the Coral Reefs. Yeah. yeah, so looking back on you know how far you've gone since the beginning of this journey in January 2022 when you first started making these, you know, you know at the start actually did you have, do you start making this with the intention of doing an exhibition with them? Uh, yes, so the idea of the to do the solo was in 2017, 2018, but I felt I wasn't ready, like I didn't have the skills or the technique. Um, so that's where all the experimentation, the sampling came in. Um, so when it came to last year, beginning of 2022, when I had more time, um, I that's when I did the experimentation and then the first stage was just to create something and I could see that it would work and that was the, the colored corals that you see at the back. Um, that was the first set and that was made in November and then when I saw that I was like, okay, I can do this, let's mm -hmm. go for something bigger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I already had the concept for this uh, mm -hmm. at the back of my mind, it was just putting it down into words. Yeah. Mm. So um, yeah. So I yeah. I do feel that it it was something that was leading up um, to the exhibition mm. that we have now. Oh, I see. So yeah. it, this exhibition, the conception of it didn't just start in January last year. No, in fact, it, it was yeah. 2017, 18, since we five, six years in the making. Yeah, so Amazing. it's just like, um, but I mean, actually putting it on paper was, yeah, in last year, basically. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so it, it's good to see that it's all. Yeah, that part is yeah. a big leap from, you know, being uh, someone who just makes things and then, you know, starts participating in exhibitions to that road of, you know, getting into track of uh, having your own solo exhibition. It's yeah. actually a big step to make. It's, it's been a huge learning curve because I think for me, I know nothing about installing. Uh, I didn't have connections with galleries and it was just so happens that Tony had opened the space so I felt like the stars had aligned um, and then in terms of uh, like uh, installing the setting up the space and then the light the lighting which is very important I didn't have any idea so it was it's good it was good that I had like friends to ask mm -hmm. um, and they gave like um, ideas on how to install and then uh, how to set up. Yeah, so oh. yeah, a, a lot of yeah, a lot of learning points along the way. Yeah, yeah. And I can see that a lot of your learning is purely through hands-on discovery and mm. also through your support network. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I can see that you're, you, the way you work is very collaborative. You like to ask people to... Uh, people will naturally chime in when there's something that they can mm -hmm. help with. Mm -hmm. And you know, as a textile artist in Singapore, we have a very, very small community. Yeah. Small but growing for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we... Uh, how do you feel about, you know, being like perhaps the OG textile artist in Singapore? Oh, um, I wouldn't think I was. A, I'm the OG. Uh, I'm sure there are <laughs> there are others who came before me. Um, I, I mean, it, it's it. Well, okay. Initially, it was a very lonely journey, but that's because uh, personally, I'm an introvert, so I, I don't really like throw myself out there. Um, but when I started initially, uh, I was doing upcycling. So I met people like Adele. Lisa, it was a make it was the maker community that really got me started and um, but when I got I wouldn't say bored of upcycling, I needed something that to challenge myself. Uh, and when I started the free motion embroidery it did feel a bit lonely but um, now I feel like the the community has like grown so much and I've met more people. Um, like the two Adelines here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've been very supportive, so I'm really grateful for that. Um, yeah, so that, that's, been, that's been a very enjoyable journey so far. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when you get stressed and you like call someone, help! <laughs> yeah. 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 And I love that our textile art community has practitioners who do all sorts of, all sorts of things. Yeah. yeah. yeah and that's good. Yeah, and the thing for many people, I'm sure you might have been asked many times is, you know, what's the difference between textile art and craft? Ooh, um, okay, you might step on some toes here, but I I feel that, okay, there, there are basically two separate entities, like craft is like more utilitarian, like you crochet a bag and you use that. Art is more something where you want to express uh, a um, oh god! I suddenly lost the word for it. You want to express an idea, or you have a message that you want to bring across through a certain you know um, piece. So in some ways they're they're separate, but you can also use craft techniques in art, like what we're doing. You know, like I'm doing. I'm using embroidery. Um, I'm using a sewing machine. Um, so when I actually I try to explain, especially to my family that I'm doing textile art, um, the first thing that comes to their mind um, is, oh, you're doing, a, you're doing craft, you're sewing clothes, uh, can you make me a set of curtains? That's a question. And I can understand why they, they ask those questions or why they say that, and that's because um, the, the techniques that we're, use, we're using now is very gendered in the past. Like It's always been women who embroider. They're probably embroidering at home. Um, meeting at home or using the sewing machine, so I can I can I can see how that that has been skewed. But nowadays, you can see that, um, especially with embroidery, um, people use it to empower themselves. They use it to convey messages of like, feminism or you know um, climate change, something like that. So it's changing, um, hopefully for the better, especially in Singapore, since it's something that's quite new. I would say. 
Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and you also previously offered workshops. You might still be offering workshops, teaching people about how to embroider. Yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. So actually, next uh, weekend as part of the exhibition, I'll be sharing about embroidering, embroidery onglings and um, stitch meditation, meditating with stitch. So that will be next weekend. And yeah, I do offer free motion embroidery workshops as well. Mm -hmm. So at least people can actually experience the, the, the whole process that I go through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is how the community grows. And apparently it's not something that's very common among artists. Yeah, it's uh, not it's not usual to see an artist who's so willing to you know share about the techniques they're using, about the stories that they are trying to portray. You know, um, if we may ask, what drives you through all of this? Because it's so much effort, so much time, so much you know mm -hmm. even heart pain. Like because the subject of your matter happens in this case to be the loss of our corals, the decline, and as an environmentalist, I'm sure that's really hard for you. So how do you cope with all of that? Oh, actually the, I mean, just looking back on it, the, once you finally set it up, there's sort of a relief and a, a joy to it. Um, in terms of like, um, the, the whole process, uh, I mean, I actually enjoy, I enjoy it, even though there's a lot of stress. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, it sounds like a yeah ironic, but yeah, I I do enjoy the like sharing, talking about it, and just um, being able to showcase the work. That's I think very enjoyable. Mm. Mm. I see. Yeah. <laughs> so for you, you'd say that the process of the making yeah. itself is you know what keeps you going day after day. And at the end of it, you know, what it is, is the story that brings it all together and being able to share that with people. Yeah, I, I think um, when I make things, uh, I feel like I'm in a safe space, like I feel very calm. I think anyone who makes with their, with their hands, um, they'll feel that. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone, yeah, most people here, <laughs> you probably make with your hands mm -hmm. something, right? So it's that whole process of, the repetitive process of like needle and thread or on the sewing machine or even when you use your paintbrush there's that calming feeling mm -hmm. yeah and and when I teach people these techniques of you know the technique of free motion embroidery or even just hand stitching it's basically um, allowing them to have being able to create that um, Zen or creative zone mm -hmm. themselves yeah. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. when I see your work, I feel that sense of calm. I feel that sense of harmony. The colors are so beautiful. Oh, thank you. And then I look at it and I realize, wait a minute, you know, these are actually dead corals. Mm -hmm. These are things that are happening because we as a humanity have not been the best stewards of our environment. Yeah. So the really the objective is just to get uh people to question their relationship with the environment. Um, but also, once they've seen this, they'll realize they'll come to see that. Okay, hang on a minute. I need to slow my life down. Once I slow my life down, you know, uh, I'll get to appreciate the things that I already have and have around me. So that's yeah, the whole idea behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So regardless of whether it's corals or whether it's the trees or the weeds, mm -hmm. just to appreciate what we have. Mm. Yeah. And we can only do that when we really slow down and just yes. take care of ourselves and you know notice what's in us and around us. Yeah, because I, I think no matter what you do in life, there's no point in going through life really frazzled and irritated because you can convey this, um, I guess like an angry message. Mm. Yeah, that's not, not nice. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm by no means the most zen person. I'm like I'm still going on this journey, so I don't want people to have this impression that Agatha is very zen. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still like on this like um, journey of discovery about myself. I see. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of journey of discovery, I've been looking at you know the the works over there that you've prepared for um, for this talk yeah. for this conversation. So these yeah. are actually the samples that yeah. I did. So originally I was going to have these on like um, a projector, but the projector broke down. So this oh. is, oh. yeah. 
So um, initially, like uh, my initial works were very two-dimensional, as you can see here. So some of you might have seen this uh, in my previous works. Mm -hmm. um, they were like uh, on organza as well, free motion embroidered. Uh, and then this is my, these were the samples that I did for, this is my initial sample for Fragile Beauty. And that's when I used like a batik paint and then I did the embroidery anglaise using the machine. So this is when I was like, yes, I can do this on machine now. And this was my initial sample of embroidery anglaise using hand. And this took a long time. This is like the initial stages. Yeah. So on Sunday, we'll be just I'll be just sharing the basics. Um, and this was my initial sample for the uh, relics. So it's concrete cast uh, onto the embroidery. So I wanted to create the impression of a, a fossil coral, fossilized coral. Yeah, and um, I wanted to make it stick on, on felt. So this was my initial sample. So I had this stuck and it was like, hang, like placed like this for like a, a week or so. And I was like, okay, I can do this. Yeah, and then I did, I did the rest. Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, and then when we were doing the, I was doing this, uh, I was trying to figure out a way of how to illuminate the corals. So my initial concept was uh, to have holes on each individual piece. And then looking at it now, I don't think it would be possible because they're like 200 over and they're all overlapping. So it, yeah, it didn't work out. So I, I'm actually pleased with this uh, format, um, the style. So the lights are actually on, uh, on a base. And then I muted the lights, uh, LED lights, using uh, calico fabric and the craft paper. So it doesn't look as though you're at a disco, which I felt was really important. Because <laughs> whenever everybody thinks of LED lights, they think of like disco, you know. Yeah. So no, I didn't want that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the lights you mentioned earlier are Arduino controlled. Yes. And right. there's an element of interactivity with yeah. the audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could you share a little bit more about that? Okay, so uh, we found a code that uh, for the lights that um, actually allow the base of the corals to flicker as though they were in the ocean. So like, you know how when the light shines on, on water, there's this flickering mm -hmm. effect. So we had that. But that the color also represents um, like the, the corals actually being very vibrant and they're alive. Uh, and then the sensor here is a motion sensor. So where Johnson is sitting, like when you approach in that direction, then um, it will actually s stop the flickering to ha from happening. And then um, it will actually fade from blue to white. Yeah. So um, Sam actually taught me that um, when the corals are bleached, it doesn't mean they're dead. They're just trying to survive. Yeah, and um, the color goes because the uh, symbiotic, I think it's algae. Is it algae? I can't, oh gosh, yes, I algae. should know this. Yeah, algae. <laughs> They've actually left the corals because the situation, the environment in that space is not ideal. Uh, and so when that happens, uh, they actually, the corals actually bleach, they turn white, and if the environment gets better, then um, the, uh, the algae go back in, goes back in and then they'll survive. But if it's uh, bleached for extended periods of time, that's when they start to die off because there's no food, and then they'll end up black or grayish color. Oh. Mm. Okay, that's a new thing that I've learned about corals. I thought yeah. that the moment they're bleached, they're dead already. Oh no, so that, that's something yeah. I uh, didn't know about either. Yeah. Mm. Okay, wow. Well, thanks for sharing about the motion sensor. I was wondering, you know, about that one over there with the, <laughs> with the white colored uh, packing paper and this. By the way, I love your innovative use of these like materials that, you know, <laughs> like, 
they're just available and no one would think of using them yet. Look at it, it's so amazing. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it's funny how I came upon this packing paper because uh, I came across it because of Lisa. Mm -hmm. She had used it to pack her shoes for an exhibition and then as she unpacked it, <laughs> I was like, aha, uh -huh. <laughs> this is very interesting material. And then I asked Lisa, okay, can I actually borrow that and try it? And then, yeah, it works. So I actually got some more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, materials can be used in all sorts of different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that. It's actually a, uh, a, it's a safety light, if I'm not mistaken. So when it goes pitch dark, the lights. Yeah, for the blackout. Yeah, for yeah. the blackout. Ooh. So I didn't want that to be um, part of the exhibition. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yet it looks like, you know, this space has been almost transformed into an ocean where we have like ocean rocks. At least that's what I see oh, um, when I see yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will be trying this motion sensor later on. Okay. So the key is just walk towards it from where Johnson is sitting? Yeah. Ah, I see. And it will change in like a few seconds. Yeah, not immediate because it's a gradual transition. Mm. Mm. I love that, you know, that what's happening to corals is almost like a microcosm of what could happen to society. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Because, um, so I learned from Sam that corals are basically the forests, rainforests of the ocean and they provide different um, benefits to like the marine life and also to uh, the community of well, humans actually because they protect the coastline so once they're gone then yeah that's it for us <laughs> mm. yeah. and we can apply that to ourselves as well like when we're under stress suddenly you know we won't have time to do a lot of things that previously mm. gave us life mm. That's and right. it takes some time to, to recover and get back to that vibrant, lively state. Yeah, that's right. So after this exhibition, I'll be taking a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's important. Um, so that's one of the things I find about slowing down is uh, many people think that it's about going at snail pace, which I, it's, it's totally not the case because slowing down basically means just taking the time to reflect and reassessing your life because I realized that once you just you know hit that treadmill and just keep going and going and going you don't have that opportunity to ask yourself hey you know is this the direction I should be going at should I be taking doing something else you know um, is there anything that I've learned which is why people do journals you know at the end of the day they, they write down you know what have I learned how did I you know what did I do to you know, pr promote my art practice or you know things like that so maybe at the end of the week you just look back and say hey I did make some progress I'm not that bad you know yeah <laughs> Yeah, and with slowing down, there's intentionality, there's mm. thought, there's, you know, a sense yeah. of every action you yes. do has to contribute to some direction that you're in in the first place. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I love that you also get to track your personal progress as you go along with that journaling practice. You know, it's in line with what you do in your creative research, jotting down all yes. the steps as the project, the idea develops. Yeah, I have a lot of um, sketch, well, notebooks, like the uh, experiment experimentation notebooks and sketchbooks and I don't know should I because I've always thinking like it's piling up like do I want to you know get rid of them or do I just want to keep them but then I'm thinking I'm hoarding so yeah that's another question I don't know maybe someone here might share what they do with their journals and sketchbooks and yeah Have you tried digitizing them? I don't really, I like the touch and feel oh, of yeah. just flipping through, yeah. Then it's time to make shelves. <laughs> make shelves. <laughs> I'm looking at... Maybe you should them. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that would be <laughs> very <laughs> vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> like, revealing my oh, soul. Yeah. Um, you, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but... By the time you, you become a senior artist, it's no longer vulnerable. Vincent Leon has an exhibition that shows all his sketchbooks from the right. day he, he was a student. But how, how do you know you're a senior artist? Can I ask you that question? Rheumatism. <laughs> <laughs> when the Alzheimer's <laughs> sets in. <laughs> we don't care anymore. We don't feel vulnerable anymore. Yeah. 
no fucks given. That's right. <laughs> but, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably gonna censor that in the video. <laughs> Actually, oh, have you yeah. ever like opened one of your older books and then you're like, did, when did I actually write this? Have you ever had it? Uh, I, okay, so I have at home, I have a uh, sort of like a sketchbook but with uh, sewing like samples. And I have opened it and I was like, oh, this looks ugly. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, and then you realize, oh, okay, I have progressed, you know? Like when you're feeling like, oh, I feel really bad today. It's like, okay, just look at the. <laughs> you stop, stop looking at social media. It's like, okay, okay, I'm doing okay. I'm on track. <laughs> so sort of yeah. No, but that's because you, if you have grown so much, when you look at like, these yeah, are kid stuff, kid stuff, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's but like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the but the sketchbooks. I guess when I when I saw Vincent Liao's exhibition, the 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 main thing is it ties with some of the exhibitions that you see through the years. Oh, so you could yeah. you could see. I mean, imagine now instead of we having just this exhibition, right? Mm -hmm. You have your sketchbooks, which is in the idea stage. <laughs> then you have your prototypes, it's almost like going to the product design exhibition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then, then you have the material selection, then maybe things like that. Then there'll be, there'll be things that maybe, maybe sometimes you feel that those are not related, but it shows the character of the, of the artist as well. Mm -hmm. Then it ties into the, the entire uh, value of, of viewers looking at not just the art but now being uh, artists that have exhibited for a while mm -hmm. then they tend to have a chance to see more of the artists as right. well yeah so yeah. before the technique comes right then you can see yeah. so there's quite a lot of value in mm -hmm. doing that yeah yeah because also I one uh, it's called in, in Spain it's called becoming Picasso so it's right. showing Picasso's uh, sketches, oh. and, yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, true to his uh, I didn't see the exhibition. I only saw the Vincent <laughs> Yama. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Picasso also wanted to go back to drawing like a four-year-old, because when he was he was such a prodigy that when he was young, he was already drawing like an adult. Like he was able to paint oh. an adult. And so it, the the ability to return back to childlikeness yeah. and like mm. like being able to mm. oh. just squiggle. Yeah, but he's and the true master. <laughs> uh, he was also a horrible man. So. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think one thing about sharing um, like your production sketches, concept sketches, is that it also shows a bit of how you progress from the beginning to the end kind of thing. And it's useful especially if you have got people looking to do an embroidery or looking to be an artist, like understanding that you don't start out being the artist, you start out struggling and those are the relatable parts mm -hmm. at that point in life. And I think that um, I guess being vulnerable really is just itself. convincing you to like expose all yeah. your journals. <laughs> Show us the good. They're very messy. Show us everything. <laughs> Show us everything. I mean, do, do curate a bit. It's, as in do curate a bit. I mean, you, you've got too many books, I feel so. But, uh, but, I think, but I think it is really useful. Like, it's really, really useful. And, understanding and seeing where you start and then where you are now and maybe mm. where you might be going in the future. Those are all actually very, very meaningful. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I guess it will boil down to the intention of the exhibition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's I, true. I do hope one day to be able to come into <coughs> exhibition and see welcome to the world of Aggie. You know? Um, <laughs> there is still a theme behind it, but we also get to see some progression and also at some points of development, what were your thoughts about this? And we get to mm -hmm. more um, learn empathy with the process of art making with the artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is a journey that not everyone undertakes, but we can all respect what goes on behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, maybe many years down the road. <laughs> <laughs> But for sure, I think the process of curation 
Might be akin to, you know, walking down memory lane, like, mm -hmm. you go back and look at your childhood photos, and you're like, oh, what am I wearing? <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But those are the things that, you know, I think everyone can relate to, going back to our younger days and just seeing how, how it was like, or at least what we can or can't remember about what happened uh, mm -hmm. that we may have long forgotten. Mm -hmm. So how did you choose corals? Um, so, okay, what happened was during that time where I took a step back from the... NEA? No, 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 no. <laughs> this is the, this is the, the second, okay, is it milestone? Okay, so and leaving NEA was the first one. The, the second one was like uh, taking a step back from the ethical fashion scene. Mm and then slowing down, um, just exploring uh, my surroundings. I took a trip, my friend actually uh, took, asked me to go on this trip to this island in between Malaysia and Singapore, Pala Marambong if I remember correctly. And there was this community uh, uh, in Malaysia that actually gets the locals, local villagers to uh, explore this island. So it was low tide and I went there and unfortunately I don't have the slides I can show you. It's really beautiful. So it had like tubular corals and they had like sea grapes and a lot of stuff and I'm like wow this is so pretty and you know I was taking lots of pictures and I was just amazed by the colors and the, the shapes and the forms and at that time I was starting the my free motion embroidery as well and I also during that time, it was the Ooh. Singapore Eco Film Festival, and they were, they showed Chasing Coral. So in that particular documentary, I think they had taken a snapshot 2014 to 2017. They showed that in particular areas, uh, there was a massive bleaching uh, process, and they had lost like I think it was like 70, 75 percent of the coral. Yeah, and that that really touched me because I was thinking, hang on a minute. Nobody sees corals on a day-to-day -day basis and um, nobody realizes how important these creatures are, but they're actually, you know, they're actually being killed off slowly. And yeah, I think Sam told me like 50% have died since the 1960s, so that's a lot. Um, so yeah, I wanted to bring, yeah, these corals into my art and showcase them, yeah. Because not everyone goes diving. So actually, someone, everyone who comes to this exhibition, well, most people say, do you dive? Do you scuba dive? I don't. I can swim, but I don't dive. Yeah, so yeah. So if you don't go diving or you go, to, go snorkeling, you won't be able to see them. Yeah. And you have to match the tides as well. So. Yeah. And they're yeah, very pretty creatures. So. <laughs> So good a comment for the talk, you know. Thanks for the talk and kind of like a partial <coughs> artist talk, but usually artists talk don't 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 include like a free spiritual session, yeah. <laughs> you know, about slowing down. Thanks for oh, that. Oh, okay. Because yeah. that 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 has been like um, central to my choosing the topics, the the subjects. Because if I don't slow down. I wouldn't be able to choose, oh, I'm going to do weeds, or, you know, I don't notice the textures, the colors, the lines of my surroundings that inspire me to create my mm. work. Yeah, so I think every artist has a different motivation or inspiration behind their work. For me, it's like, yeah, it's basically that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, would, I don't know, sounds is it like, spiritual? Sounds like listening, <laughs> listening to a Zen. <laughs> Uh, I think it's like more yeah. about wellness, taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's about a way of life and I feel that art is part of practicing that way of life as well. So for me, I guess as a practitioner, mm -hmm. I also I fully understand what Aggie is saying by that idea of slowing down because the start of inspiration isn't like, oh, you get an idea for an artwork in your head. The start of inspiration is opening your eyes, opening your senses, looking around mm -hmm. at what's you know around you and seeing what interests you. 
and what interests you about that thing that interests you because that is beauty to you, your own perception of beauty, your own perspective that allows mm. you to convey that beauty in some other way, you know, through your own personal processing to other people as well. Yeah, that's mm. beautifully put. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Mm. So, I hope that explains. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> well, quite a lot of things you say it's, it's quite new to me you know? oh, right. because okay. like for example slowing down mm -hmm. and then I never thought that slowing down is taking time to reassess your life because every yeah, time yes. when I have to reassess my life yes. that would mean that I have to plan for the next journey doesn't doesn't give me the thought of slowing down so are you always reassessing your life when you're in crisis mm. So I, I don't I don't see that as that. But then okay. also you know, I, I mean I hear thousands of artists talk, so seldom I would hear context. Johnson goes to every No no no, it's okay. Yeah. So usually I don't hear the artists talk about the discipline so much and mm. then the physical exhibition making the deadline. Usually I don't hear the, right. the, the, the aspect. So also I don't hear the aspect of, of project management because quite right. a lot of artists okay. are actually uh, being managed probably, by probably they, they somehow manage it but mm. they don't have a Active vocabulary for it. Okay. So because of your corporate background and dealing with environment, right? So mm. you have certain things that I don't hear commonly. Right. In a, in so what artist. what what have you heard then? Like what do you like when you go for? Artists, Usually is they about? they won't be able to say as project management more like determination and oh we made it yeah. You know, mm. something along that line. The survival yeah. bias. <laughs> survival like bias. Yeah, you just you just listen to your friends. You just listen to all your artist friends. You they <laughs> are like that. Mm. I know uh, most Laurent, of them. Laurent will be able to speak a bit differently. Yeah. yeah no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I love Maybe. the practical aspects yeah. of it. So when people okay. say like, don't give up, be determined, resilience, I'm like, okay, abstract. Yes, we, we can all kind of buy into that idea, but what does that mean for us? And for an artist running a show, that means the project management. We have to be on top of it, this, that, and I love how you shared that. Yeah, Listen, there are yeah. so many parts, especially after I, I took the NAC grant, because they um, when you su make the submission, there are so when you you have to give your budget, right? So there are lots of lines, you know, like different areas that you uh, need to do. And so once you've got that down, then you realize, oh man, I need help, you know, because <laughs> right? you can't do everything, you know. Mm. So which is why you have to outsource and try and get other people to help you just to get things moving, yeah, because mm. it's only one of me, yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So handling the creative aspect, the organizational aspect, and even being the face of the show, the advocacy aspect of it all, mm. it's a lot of weight. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but I, I'm glad I got help. I mean, um, mm -hmm. Tony was helping me, and then I um, managed to get help for like copywriting, etc., etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It takes a village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What's next? <laughs> What's next? A Are break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do hope to continue uh, making sculptural works because I, I find that really fascinating and it's very challenging. Um, someone asked me whether I would make bigger concrete pieces. Uh, so that's probably the next challenge for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but first the break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Good tea and cake as well. well. Scuba diving. <laughs> Would you want to go scuba diving? Mm, maybe snorkeling. 
Yeah. I'll say start with snorkeling. Yeah. Because many of us is a scuba dive. Yeah. Actually, um, it, it's quite funny because when I was a kid, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Mm. Yeah, so that involves like what basically what Sam does, like snorkel, uh, scuba diving and stuff. And then um, I watched this movie about sharks. And I got scared. <laughs> <laughs> I got scared. And so okay, that was that was the end of the marine biology. But Sam also crew. answered your your fear as well. He said, hey, "Look at all these baby sharks. Yeah. There's no this, big sharks. Yeah, yeah. this is in Singapore." Sharks, yeah. 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 <laughs> he was showing photos of sharks and he said, hey, it's a baby shark. They yeah. don't have big sharks around, but that's not true, I think. I have a question. So after this exhibition is over, you mentioned that Aki is actually one of the foreigners of textile artists in Singapore. So where would you, um, where would you go to see other textile art in Singapore? And where would all these beautiful things be? Place and people can go and yeah. Um, so until the twenty fifth, it will be here. Mm -hmm. um, they will be in my home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, some of, yeah, actually the relic pieces and the pieces behind me are for sale. So yeah, some have sold. So they'll be going to good homes. Mm -hmm. Yay! Mm -hmm. Yeah, for this piece, uh, it's modular, so I'll just break it apart. Um, not break it apart, but take it apart. And um, I'm planning to make it frame into smaller pieces mm -hmm. if no one, no one wants to see it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got yeah. a follow-up question after that. Oh. Building yeah. on that same question. Okay. I, I mean, her question. So I would like to phrase it a little bit different. So. So you have a community of artists here also, right? So, so where do we go and see their work besides your work? And the other question is about, there's, some of them would be considered craft artists, right? Before they become, I, I, I prefer to use the word contemporary artists. So, so when I say contemporary artists, what I mean is, so it's it's a piece of craft, but if it's without idea, I won't I won't consider it a piece of art. Yeah. So if we want to see not just art only, we also want to see craft that would expand the the possibility, right? Like I yeah. have seen a beautiful shoes, if I'm correct. Oh, I remember uh, my shoes. <laughs> yes, yes, I saw shoes before. Then her clothes, yeah. So that would expand the, the viewing possibility. Not necessarily just art, but also the big part of the craft. Because if I look at sculpture, beautiful vases, bowls and all that, to me, they are craft works that, that is equivalently great as art. Yeah. So maybe, maybe some of you have some place where we can see your work and also share with us. Yeah, I think most of the, like most people have either home studios, they also open their studios up. Like Melanie, she has a solo at the moment too. Yeah. I'll yeah. let you know after. <laughs> so you, you can go and see it. <laughs> Mine is very, very spiritual. So you, maybe you might oh. be interested. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an immersive experience. Immersive, yeah. <laughs> So, so is there any umbrella organization in Singapore that all these home studios can register there? I don't know who would know where they are, no? Oh, and then like, for me, I'm, a, I've, yeah, I've been idea. away from Singapore for a very long time and I'm just coming back. I don't know anything. I didn't even know such things existed here. I've been away that long. Yeah. So I'm so wow. thrilled to see so you. So know. you have to start a textile art organization. You need to do textile art open house. Promotion. <laughs> Like there's a craft collective, critical craft collective. Yeah, there are shows yeah. once in a while around yeah. Singapore. Yeah. So how art is in Singapore is it's a little bit um, some might say fragmented because it's mostly individual <coughs> efforts. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some websites that will list what's happening at any point of time. So like the A list, if I'm not wrong, mm -hmm. the S A G G as well. Um, then you have Bernie Tan's own like personal. Uh, updated once in a while uh, list of shows that she likes that you can check out. She's a curator in Singapore who also does textile art. 
And of course, you could definitely follow the textile artists in the room. There's Eddie. Yeah. I don't know if I, I could point out yeah, Elias. Yeah, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's Lisa. Lisa makes shoes. So Lisa Ting Studios, was it? Yeah. Yeah, that's on Instagram. Yeah. Can we also assign this space? Like, I think the point is that um, if you may correct me, um, the art industry in Singapore is very focused on um, a space that facilitates, I suppose, the business of it and also um, the contemporary and fine versus others, right? And so having a space that is that allows for the open exhibition of, of, uh, of integrating everything together it doesn't really exist yet. I do wonder if Sinus is uh, trying to kind of merge that or be more Sinus open. Is um, a bit different. It's more mm. of a multidisciplinary yeah. creative space. Mm. So actually, they were performance based previously, but then mm. it evolved for them, and then they started featuring artists, but. In their space, it's not about a gallery show. They are all very focused on storytelling. Yeah. So any artist that goes there, we have to do storytelling, how a certain show comes mm -hmm. about for, or whatever experience that the artist wants to bring forth in the show, mm -hmm. we tell the story. Yeah. So it's a totally different uh, process and uh, experience all together when you go to this uh, mm. sino space. Yeah, mm. so it's very interesting. So it's always tend to have multi sensory. Like over this weekend, while my work is there, they also have some sense journeys and sense memories yeah. where yeah. they engage the senses and not just purely oh just go and smell, but also about evoking memories, looking mm. into within and see how the sense evoke your experience, your memories and you know what you want possibly for yourself mm. in the future, present. Yeah. Um, but that's so how it's very yeah. interesting. But that's how art should be, right? Just yeah. evoking all your senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is why we actually have to so I related to that very much because mm -hmm. in order for me to make the art I yeah. needed to slow down to mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. for, for the creativity to actually emerge. But Perhaps someone who has been trained from young, they start art very young, they may not realize it, but because this is their lifestyle. Yeah. Because maybe for me, Aggie, we have had corporate jobs and then we've had to learn to slow down and, and really get in touch from our the corporate life, which is all about production, productivity, yeah. producing, uh, you know, money. Yeah. And we yeah. are going into the creative side, so we actually needed to we are actually shifting our brain, you know, the right mm -hmm. and left brain, so we have to slow down in order to make such beautiful works that you actually get yeah. to enjoy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, art itself is, they have many forms. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in a room, in a community of mm -hmm. slowing down, right? They have yeah. other communities, like they have a big range of art would be like angry bird kind of art. You know, I'm kind of joking, but I mean, Zealand's work are pretty angry. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's predominantly that style. Then you have, you have basically there's no no confinement. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you have angry art, but but the angry art's purpose is to expose the the ugliness of the world sometimes, mm. and also some of the angry art is actually. Reverse. That means it's a therapy for the artist as well. Mm. So, so there's many possibilities. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Such a wide range mm. of art mm. yeah. that yeah. is meant to also make us think. You know, there's a social, cultural commentary, political commentary. Mm. You know, there's all these so many different aspects of art. Mm. Yeah. And so there needs to be, I, I suppose, certain people that are willing to provide the space for that uh, to all. If, uh, space is money in Singapore. So, mm -hmm. yes. uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind it's of hard. It's yeah. hard. But, yeah. but I guess we're all connected through uh, social media. So there, online, there is a community, like we all support each other. It's just that physical space that's, that's missing, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's the online space called? 
Um, it's it's just through yeah. connecting through a, social media. We don't have a collective have at the moment, yeah. but yeah, individual people. So maybe, I can share more. Yeah, with you maybe the stopping point is her website and, and her <laughs> yeah, Facebook. and then following everyone yeah. else. Yeah. Then after <laughs> you know her, you know if you if she's somewhere, then you will link to her. Yeah. You will link to her. Yeah. I mean, that's how I get to know them as well. Yeah. So it yeah. starts from her. I think basically it's just networking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not for networking with me. Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah. your preferred? Is it Instagram or which is the. Oh, uh, so my website is aggietextileartist.com. Uh, and then you'll be able to. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the boards as yeah. well. Yeah. She okay. has IG, she has a website, she has a newsletter yeah. where she shares about her journey once in a while. Yeah. Seasonal yeah. news. <laughs> and if you follow one textile artist in Singapore, if they're connected to the yeah. network, chances are they will also mm. share yeah. about the other mm -hmm. exhibitions that are happening mm -hmm. uh, with the other artists. Mm -hmm. But who knows, there may be a collective. The last time there was a show on textile art was in 2021. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was like in May and June. Um, so I was the curator of a show called Into Softer Worlds, which brought together quite a few of the mm -hmm. textile artists in Singapore um, to just showcase what they had done uh, over two months. And at the same time, through uh, pure coincidence, Esplanade was also showing a textile art yes. exhibition. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. so <laughs> that was two years ago. Who knows when the next one will mm -hmm. be? We'll see about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's emerging, like in the whole trend is emerging. Yeah, I think it's culture and uh, craft culture globally is probably yeah, yeah. Like really just rising up. Yeah, I mean there's the, the traditional textiles like batik, which you mm -hmm. see in the front, and then there's the contemporary mm -hmm. style, which is like mine and everyone else's. Yeah. For sure, the scene yeah, is growing because growing. people are so willing to share mm -hmm. because it's also related to craft. So people who are in craft find it interesting to just explore this adjacent world of art as well and see yeah. how it's totally different from craft. Mm. Yeah, I have, you know, invited craftspeople to try their hand at art before and they just said, whoa, it's completely mind-blowing. The thought process behind making craft versus making art is completely different. Like mm. what Aggie mm. mentioned just now, craft, you're making something functional, you're making something with the end goal in mind. Whereas for art, you know, it's more of the start of it, the inspiration behind it, the process that keeps it going, and then just the message, mm -hmm. maybe to yourself, to the world, anyone, because even if nobody sees a piece of art except the artist, it is still seen, it is still art. Yeah. So maybe we get a bit more time to, to talk about your art practice, so are we ending or...? Yeah, so that's actually we are in the Q and A session now. We segue quite organically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very glad yeah. that I don't have to say. Okay, now Q and A session, guys. Please ask Aggie your questions because you're already doing that. So yeah, smooth. it's very, very smooth. smooth. Very smooth. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's you guys really. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yay. 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 about the marine life in Singapore. Why can this? I mean, I'm not. Oh, so, um, yeah, Singapore. we were told yesterday in the southern part of Singapore. Oh. So the closest would be, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Capel Bay. So you oh. actually have to sign up to go and go in and see because it's a marina. Okay, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, where the boats, where the boats are. Where the boats are, yeah. Um, so I was lucky because, okay, so the, the, the places go very quickly. Uh, at 10 o'clock, I can't remember which day it is. You just have to wait by your computer and just like click just to get in because it's free. Mm -hmm. So wow. they limit and they limit the numbers as well. And then yeah, uh, I think they were saying like Sister Islands, Kusu, that area. So this is for non-divers. Lesser, lesser. Uh, yeah, non-divers would be that the capital, mm. capital Bay area. But you need to snorkel or? No. Uh, so actually, they've uh, um, what they've done is where the. If I'm not mistaken, they're called pontoons. So, you know when you walk out into the bay area, there are these wooden platforms that rise and lower with the tide. Mm. So the corals are actually um, growing oh. on those. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I think they created some special yeah. 
concrete things so that cars yeah, can, cars can yeah. yeah, I think I saw some of mm. If you're interested, I went on a, on a walk. Um, it's organized by this guy under the name of Uhu Singapore, also on Pitix. And he brings people to walk on um, Pulau Hantu. So you actually walk in the sea to see the corals and you can visually just see them yeah. like that. It's really beautiful. Nice. Mm. Yeah. So walking in the sea. Ulu Singapore. Ulu Singapore. Ulu Singapore. Yeah. Ulu Singapore. It's actually an Angmo who's doing it. <laughs> he came to Singapore for more than 20 years. And okay. He decided he wanted to live here so he did corporate life and that's just did full-time tours around Singapore. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Super yeah. interesting, right? Actually, Anne Hawks. Yeah, Anne yeah. also does tours as well uh, on the East Coast. If I remember, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, East Coast. And then, but the thing is, because you have to go at low tide, you have to wake up really early. That's the mm. only thing that. Yeah. <laughs> the, if the tidal. In the tidal walks, ah. yeah. Like what you mentioned yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 I've been on one. You see. A Really surprising array of marine life. Yeah. So like yeah. hermit crabs, mm. you see starfish, urchins, sea yeah. snails, all sorts of mm. things. Squirts. Yeah, cucumber squirts as well. Yeah, it's amazing what Singapore has to offer. We just you know yeah. <laughs> put mm. ourselves out there and not not restrict ourselves to the idea that Singapore is a concrete jungle with nothing much else mm. to offer. Yeah. yeah. I want to go to Pulau Hantu as well, and now I want to also go to Pulau Marambong. <laughs> how, how do we, you know, get there? Is it a by invitation only thing? Um, I'll need to give you the link, because um, it's organized by uh, this collective on the southern coast of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll share the link. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if anyone else might be interested in this, these links and also like links to the textile artists if you're keen to follow others as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you happen to have everyone's emails for this talk? Mm, no. I know, okay, I know everyone. <laughs> 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 maybe not, yeah, maybe. I, I gave my Oh, you did, okay. And yourself? Register. Oh, okay. You can say you can pass your email over there. There's a there's a board. You can just write it down. Yeah. So anyone who's interested in getting all these links, finding out more, uh, perhaps you can. It's a good idea to leave your email there, then we can get in touch with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Anyone have any more questions you. before we close the session? A lot. Ah, okay. You can come find me. Yeah, you can come find me. Alright, thank you everyone. Yeah. Enjoy the artwork. Okay, thanks for the moderation. Also.